Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to a very special episode of Your Legislators. I'm your host, Johnny Coker. Today, I'm joined by New Mexico's U.S. Congressman for the state's 2nd District, Representative Gabe Vasquez. Representative, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Johnny. It's a pleasure. So let's just get right into it. Um, what brought you down here this round? Um, you know, what, what have you been talking to constituents about? Yeah, well, we're here in southern New Mexico, as well as in Albuquerque this week, uh, to understand better how we can help support economic development projects all across the district. Uh, we just had a big announcement for a $63 million investment that we helped to secure uh, for new EV charging stations, including in places like Vado in southern Doniana County, as well as Lordsburg. Uh, so those are really important uh, for creating jobs in rural communities. We're also going to be visiting uh, the Cibola County Detention Center. We're, uh, uh, you know, just wrapped up a visit also to Stampede uh, Meet to understand better the partnership between New Mexico State University, federal grants, and that connection to industry uh, and jobs that we can create in places like Sunland Park. So overall, an opportunity to talk with constituents uh, to understand how we can continue to create jobs in a very tough economic environment. Uh, so I'm just proud to be doing this job and being able to represent all parts of this district. Certainly. Um, will you go a little more in depth about the infrastructure for the electric vehicles? Because I know, you know, uh, oil and gas is such a big part of New Mexicans' lives, but, um, but also, you know, these alternative energy resources are also something that are on the rise. So tell me a little bit more about, um, about that. Well, I think New Mexico's leaders have a responsibility to look to the future. And that includes what jobs are going to look like in places like Vado and Lordsburg. And so these new EV charging stations that are really meant for commercial transport are gonna make sure that our major corridors like I-40 and I-10 continue to be viable, that are actually gonna lower the cost of good for Americans and at the same time produce cleaner transportation methods that are going to drive down costs, that are going to create jobs. And so those investments are going to come uh, in the way of a partnership with a company called Terawatt uh, that's going to create this opportunity, not just for the charging stations themselves, but we actually have now a manufacturing facility that's going to help to produce the components of these vehicles down in Santa Teresa. So we can build it here, we can charge it here, and we can make sure that both the I-25 corridors and the communities that are sprinkled in between, as well as on I-40, benefit from uh, this new industry. And so that's really looking towards the future of what jobs look like in these communities. And also to make sure that, you know, as uh, our reliance uh, on fossil fuels uh, lessens over time, that we are well positioned uh, to be a prime beneficiary of that industry. Mm. And, and speaking of the oil and gas industry, um, you know, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, um, U.S. oil production is actually on the rise and is expected to hit uh, record levels this year in terms of barrels per day and New Mexico is feeling is feeling that because we we get so much money from the oil and gas industry and in in this legislative session there's a lot of surplus because of that mm -hmm. um, so what's your your message to advocates who feel like there might be some backsliding going on there in terms of mm -hmm. you know looking for those um, other resources well, you bring up an important point, and that is that oil and gas production uh, during the Biden administration has increased exponentially, and New Mexico has been a beneficiary. You know, we're lucky that we sit atop the Delaware Basin, which is one of the most productive basins of the entire Permian Basin area in the southeast part of the state. And you're right, it brings record revenues to our state legislature for schools and education, hospitals, uh, and other needs that we have in the state, and that is terrific. Uh, my stance is always that we should be producing oil and gas responsibly, uh, and we can do that. We can also be doing a much better job of protecting workers in this industry. That's why I introduced uh, a bill specifically uh, to help those workers that are exposed to toxic pollutants, uh, volatile organic compounds, things like methane, while they're out in the field, be able to have the health care compensation that they need and that they deserve. And so when I look to the future of the oil and gas industry, I want to make sure that the workers in that industry are protected uh, that we're protecting those small businesses that also rely on the oil and gas industry uh, while the industry is here. Certainly, and and that's the Santa Teresa Port of Entry is a big corridor that seems to have a lot of industry surrounding it, and that's something that you're looking to um, 
to push moving into the future and help build up. So t tell me a little bit about that. How important is it to get industry to play the borderland region mm -hmm. and to help New Mexicans? This is a story that I love to tell my colleagues in Congress. It's the story of the Santa Teresa Industrial Park and Industrial Complex. Uh, it truly is budding into a binational community. Uh, you know, I had the pleasure to work on legislation that helps both strengthen border security but also improves uh, border commerce, right? The faster that we can get trucks moving in and coming in from places like San Jeronimo and Ciudad Juarez into our communities, into those warehouses in Santa Teresa that are doing uh, light assembly, storage, logistics, manufacturing, back office jobs, uh, the more money that we'll create uh, here for not just Doña Ana County, but in terms of exports for the state of New Mexico, we are leading right now, uh, more than Bernalillo County, in fact, because of the sanitary support of entry. And so being able to get new inspection technology at the border that detects illicit drugs like fentanyl, other opioids, and any miscellaneous number of shipments that could be coming from both commercial and non-commercial vehicles, we're also at the same time speeding up traffic, uh, which allows uh, those companies to invest in Santa Teresa, and truly we have a blank canvas in southern New Mexico uh, in the southern part uh, of the state between the Palomas port of entry uh, and the uh, in Columbus and also in Santa Teresa uh, to be able to create the near uh, the inshoring ports of the future and we are seeing record investments uh, thanks to the economic development department here in the state and the work that we've been doing to make this a friendly place for people to do business mm. and representative you you mentioned border security and that's obviously a big issue in our region and as well nationally. And, and you grew up in the borderland and you're a former Las Cruces city councilor. Um, so that, I think that gives you a unique perspective on immigration compared to many other US lawmakers um, in Washington. So what, what do you tell other lawmakers when it comes to the current situation at the border? What's, what perspective do you share with them? Sure. Well, the situation at our border, our southern border is complex. It is complicated and it is changing uh, every year. You know, different factors, the different pull factors of, uh, in particular, migrants that are seeking asylum, uh, not just from the Northern Triangle in Central America, but increasingly Caribbean countries and other countries as well, has really changed the dynamic of our asylum system and how we're able to cope uh, with uh, this influx of migrants. And so, uh, you know, what I tell folks is, look, the 180 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border that I represent, I've been on most of those miles, and that includes visiting with ranchers, that includes uh, being uh, in uh, trucks with Border Patrol agents, that includes on horseback in places south of Animas on the Diamond A Ranch. So I know this border region very, very well, and that also includes meeting with customs agents at our ports of entry to understand exactly what is happening. Um, so the perspective that I bring to Washington, D.C. is one of education so that folks who think that they're going to come here and see some type of militarized war zone actually understand that it's a humanitarian crisis and that we have to deal with it head on. Um, I just recently introduced a package of five bills that deal with different parts of both the immigration and the border security crisis. Uh, and, and that's really important because we have to be able to bring solutions that matter to the people of southern New Mexico, all of New Mexico, and to the nation. And so whether it's the need for farm workers, which right now we have a tremendous need for, and a shortage of farm workers, you know, just by visiting folks like the Gillis Farms up in Hatch uh, who can't find enough workers uh, for their onion harvest, we have to be able to meet the moment of today uh, with, uh, with the challenges that we face at the border. And so uh, my job is really to educate my, my colleagues in Congress about what actually happens down here at our ports of entry, how people are processed, uh, what, what could actually solve this crisis that we are facing, uh, and we've got a lot of work to do. Certainly. And so in terms of, you know, those five immigration bills that you inter or introduced, a couple of them address, you know, allowing migrants to move through, you know, through workforce like, um, you know, healthcare jobs or other essential jobs or through those um, agricultural jobs into getting permanent resident status. I am I correct in that? It's temporary resident status, and it essentially says that, temporary, look, okay. temporary resident status that could potentially lead to permanent residency status under certain conditions. Uh, that's just an important piece to put forward because, again, if we want to be smart about who we are as a country, as a country of a nation of immigrants, and we want to be able to make sure that we meet the demand of the jobs, to meet the demand of our economy, you know, we have one of the strongest economies in the world, and it is because of migrant labor. It has been that way for decades and decades, and it's going to continue to be that way. So we have important positions to fill in education and in healthcare, and as we were talking just earlier, building our infrastructure. So we have to be smart about border policy. We have to be smart about immigration policy, and we can do that. 
Uh, but we can't do it when we have folks you know, that uh, want to make this a political issue. And so my job is to go up uh, to Washington, D.C. and say, here's the solutions that we're proposing. And I'm confident that if my bills got a vote on the House floor, that they would pass with bipartisan support. In my own reporting, I've run into you know, migrants crossing the border illegally um, because, and, and they said they were pushed that way you know, through human smuggling and things like that because the asylum process takes too long and they were too desperate and they just had to find a way to get out of their current situation. Do you feel like your bills would be able to address that well, Johnny, you're absolutely correct about that. And yes, our immigration system as it currently stands is completely outdated. And those waiting times uh, for folks to have the visas to be able to come and work in this country right now are unattainable uh, for most people around the world. Uh, and it's just not meeting the demand that we have here domestically. Um, so there's a combination of a broken immigration system and, of course, the cartels, the polleros, right, the, uh, the coyotes. Uh, that's why I introduced the Coyotes Act, is to directly deal with human trafficking and smuggling. And what we're seeing is that a lot of Americans are actually part of the problem because they're connected to the cartels. And so when I go down and talk to Mayor Javier Perea in Sullen Park or the police chief in Sullen Park or even our Doñana County Sheriff, uh, and they tell me that high school kids are being recruited by the cartels to be drivers or to facilitate human trafficking and smuggling activity, well, you know, I think that's unacceptable. And we absolutely have to tackle this problem from the criminal end. Uh, and that includes holding coyotes, holding the cartels accountable, because there is a massive ring of misinformation that is being spread through a cartel network in places like Mexico, Central America, and some of these other countries of origin where migrants are coming from. And that absolutely has to stop. Uh, and that's one of the things I've asked the president and House leadership to do, uh, either in letters or in recent meetings with them. I said, look, if we don't use the State Department to put out accurate information about the process to get into this country, we're never going to win the information war against the cartels. Mm. And, and Representative, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, bad actors, um, you know, taking advantage of this situation at the border. Um, I think in Las Cruces, Last year, uh, the LCPD seized 70, almost 70,000 fentanyl pills, mm -hmm. a growing issue. And so what's your response to individuals who might think we need to clamp down at the border and you know, stop most of the f or flows of migration, stop the flow of the migration at its current pace in order to you know, deal with the issues that you just laid out? Well, well Johnny, I, I don't want us to confuse the humanitarian crisis with the fentanyl crisis. Those are two separate issues. And I think that's one of the things that Republicans have really wanted to conflate together because they want to make it seem as if every hardworking person that comes to this country seeking asylum or wanting work uh, is somehow also involved in the drug trade. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. The cartels who through their organized crime rings are pushing fentanyl into our communities are separate from the humanitarian crisis. And that uh, couldn't be more clear as we see the apprehensions at our ports of entry. Uh, these are drugs that are hidden in shipments of you know, any number of different things that are coming through our ports of entry at any given time. And they're also, the majority are American citizens who are bringing fentanyl into our country. Again, as I mentioned, those young teenagers, you know, those young Americans, uh, or other people who are desperate for money, those are the folks who are bringing that, uh, those drugs either uh, by walking across the border uh, through a legal port of entry or in their non-commercial vehicles. And, and that's what we're seeing uh, in the numbers and how they're bearing out. Mm. And I, I think a lot of Americans would agree that more, there, there needs to be more bipartisanship at a national level and at the congressional level. And I understand you're part of the bipartisan Southwest Caucus, so I'll just lay out the floor. Can you give me a little yeah. information about that? Yeah, Johnny, well look, uh, I think that for far too long, Washington has missed uh, the mark on any number of things that could help improve not just our border communities, but Southwest states and Southwest communities overall. So when I got to Congress, I said, who are the Congress people in regions just like mine that I can work with and what are the things that we can agree on? And so the first person I went to was Congressman Juan Cisco Manny, who represents a neighboring district in Southwest Arizona. And I talked to him about some of the issues uh, that we're facing in, uh, in New Mexico, uh, economic issues, international trade, uh, certainly immigration issues, uh, but also uh, things like public lands, right? We are both uh, rich in public lands, and so things like massive record wildfires that we've seen in the Gila National Forest that actually abuts his district. Uh, 
that we could work on together. And so we're looking at folks like Tony Gonzalez out of Texas as well. Um, he represents the Eagle Pass area uh, to find commonalities and how we can work together in a bipartisan way and then propose bills together, uh, which we already have, or write letters together, which we already have uh, to the administration, help solve some of the, the, the issues to be proactive about building these relationships in Congress, because I think that's desperately needed in this very tough political environment that we face today. Mm. And, and you mentioned, I want to switch over a little bit. You mentioned the forest fires, mm -hmm. and I know you're working to, um, working on, you know, in, in the past, in the past couple of years, New Mexico has had a really bad fire season, including some prescribed burns yes. that have gotten out of hand, I guess, to put it lightly. Um, so what can we do to ensure that, that type of thing doesn't happen in the future, how, rather than be um, reactive, be more proactive? Well, look, I've held the Forest Service accountable, especially for the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire. Uh, and, uh, you know, in committee meetings, I serve on the subcommittee for forestry in the agriculture committee. And when I got a chance to question the chief of the Forest Service about what practices they would be changing for their prescribed burns, uh, I made sure to, held up, to hold up the letter uh, that I wrote to his agency, uh, you know, over two months ago that did not have a response demanding questions about how they were going to change their prescribed burn practices uh, to better meet the conditions on the ground. And what we heard from locals in places in the Gila and in places up north in Mora and San Miguel is that there was no reason that the Forest Service should have been burning during those high wind uh, environments. And they said, we don't know who they hired, uh, but obviously if us locals know that this is not the best time to be burning because they're burning brush piles, they're cleaning their acequias, they're doing different things. Uh, so we have held the forest accountable. Uh, and not just that, but now, that it comes to actual payment of uh, those individuals that were harmed due to the malpractice of the Forest Service. Uh, we just saw the FEMA director for New Mexico step down uh, because folks aren't getting paid fast enough. Uh, I just talked to the San Miguel uh, uh, chair of the county commission. I said, hey, chairman, I know I'm not in your district, but I wanna know how things are going. I wanna know if the Forest Service is actually coming through uh, with FEMA on uh, their promise to, to make good for all these residents that lost their homes, that lost their property, uh, who haven't been able to, to, to seek, uh, to get adequate compensation. And so that's critically important. Uh, one, one thing I'll say that has actually come out of New Mexico State University, a very cool project, is in the, in the Gila uh, wilderness, in a very remote place uh, where there's only certain cattle grazers that are there in these very remote federal leases, uh, New Mexico State University has started a virtual fencing pilot program because over 100 miles of pasture fence was burned down through that forest that was gonna be very tough to rebuild. And so I'm actually on a bill in Congress to help support the research that's taking place right here at New Mexico State University uh, that would essentially create virtual corridors for cattle to graze in that would eliminate the need uh, for actual pasture fences. A very successful project here. Uh, I'm actually just talking, just talked to the researcher on this project yesterday because I'm so excited about it. Uh, and so we can innovate even in the face of these, these tragedies and find opportunities uh, to, uh, to do things better uh, from, in, in terms of working the land. Mm. And, and just to switch gears a little bit, you, you talk about individuals having trouble getting compensation mm -hmm. from the government. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Radiation Exposure Compensation yes. Act that is set to expire this summer and the Tularosa Downwinders. It was on the National Defense Authorization Act for this year, but eventually got stripped and I know you're, you've, you're an, you've been an advocate for the downwinders in the yes. past. And, you know, in my own reporting, there's a lot of cynicism and sadness essentially around the stripping of that from, of RICA from the NDAA. So what's your, what's your message to individuals exposed, uh, you know, exposed individuals and members of the consortium? Well, I want to commend all the advocates uh, for lobbying so hard for this really important bill. Uh, I'm just as fr frustrated as they are because this has been a long time coming. Uh, when the government does you wrong, uh, they should be able to compensate you. And in the case of New Mexico, uh, certainly the downwinders in all parts of the state or who have suffered uh, from any part of the production of uranium in this state uh, deserve to have the compensation. And clearly we've seen uh, the health uh, impacts that have been linked to uh, either the actual testing itself or the uranium mines in other parts of the state very near our district. Uh, and it's just completely wrong that the government continues to neglect its duty to compensate folks. What happened is that this was actually led in the Senate in a bipartisan way with Senator Hawley and Senator Lujan uh, was right on top of it. They actually agreed to fund uh, RICA uh, and essentially change RICA to include uh, applicants from New Mexico. 
But what happened is that it stalled on the House floor. And so when Speaker Johnson went to negotiate the NDAA with Senate Republicans, uh, he said, this is something I'm absolutely not going to support. Now, there was a cost associated to it. But look, if we can't pay for these basic uh, things when government does you wrong and you deserve to be compensated, uh, then what are we doing as a federal government, right? And so um, I'm very sorry to those advocates who have worked so hard for so many years uh, to see RICA go this far, but I'm going to continue to fight for them. I know that the other con uh, congressional delegation, as well as Senator Heinrich and Senator Lujan, will continue to fight for RICA. So we've got another bite at the apple this year, and I just urge them to keep the fight up because I'm going to fight right alongside them. Certainly. And, and so is, is there a plan in place essentially to get that extension to, of RICA, you know, before the summer? Well, you know, the plan in place likely is, is using the NDAA as a vehicle to get RICA in, included. Uh, and NDAA gets authorized, reauthorized every year. And so now that we have bipartisan support on the Senate side, and we know how important this issue is to Senator Hawley and others who also support it, uh, we're going to continue to lobby Speaker Johnson as well as Leader Jeffries to say, look, we're, we absolutely need to right this wrong. And so what are the, what's the number that we have to come to? What is the agreement that we have to come to for Speaker Johnson potentially uh, to negotiate this into this year's NDAA? And if not this Congress, then we'll move it to the next Congress because obviously uh, we may have a new administration, a new makeup of Congress. And I'm confident that if Democrats hold the House, if they can keep the House and they hold the Senate, uh, and we have a Democratic administration, that we can get RICA compensation exposure passed into law. Mm -hmm. And so just to switch gears a little bit, I don't want to stay on that the whole time. The anniversary of Roe v. Wade was on Monday of yes. that original court decision. And you have said in the past that you're committed to fighting for reproductive care for all women across the US. Um, so how are you doing that at the congressional level? Uh, well, look, first, first and foremost, we've been defending against the attacks of Republicans who have wanted to strip or limit women's access to reproductive health care in any number of bills. You know, must pass bills, things like the NDAA that included these anti-reproductive health care uh, amendments uh, are ways that Republicans are going to continue to strip away women's rights. Uh, so this year it was all about defending uh, against uh, the changes that Republicans are, are trying to make. In individually, states across the country are passing draconian anti-reproductive health care uh, legislation. Here in New Mexico, you know, we look to the governor, we look to the legislature and others to make sure that we can continue to be a haven for reproductive health care for women that are in places like Texas uh, or other places. And right here in Chaparral, right, where we have a new clinic uh, that is going to provide those services, uh, we're going to look to see how we can continue to support uh, and provide services to all women uh, because truly those decisions are to be made uh, between a person and their doctor in consultation with their family or their faith. And it's not as uh, it's much more complicated uh, than abortion. There's so many issues that come with women's reproductive health that are private, that belong in the doctor's office. And I think uh, limiting uh, those rights is the wrong place. And look, taking away a constitutional right that's been there for more than 40 years is unprecedented in this country. So I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to continue to support legislation. I'm on the pro-choice uh, caucus in, in Congress, and I'll continue to work with my colleagues on this issue. Mm. And I understand on the Texas side and Arizona side, we're, we're surrounded by states who have restricted access to abortions. But on the northern side, we have Colorado, mm -hmm. and they've codified, um, you know, reproductive rights into their into their state law. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering. I know it's not technically your wheelhouse, but have you had conversations with state lawmakers and state legislators um, about about that, about codifying the right? to access to an abortion into New Mexico's state law. Well, listen, I, anything that we can do uh, at the state level to make sure that we codify uh, these rights into law uh, permanently and in perpetuity, uh, I think is the right step and it's the right direction. I know that several legislators are working uh, towards this end and I know the governor is very supportive. In fact, just a few years ago, uh, we repealed one of the uh, uh, old laws on the book that uh, that essentially it, it, under a Republican administration uh, would have made it easier to limit access to reproductive health care. So that was a great first step. Uh, I think we can and we should do more. Uh, and I think as long as we have uh, pro-choice fighters here in uh, our state legislature and at the governor's mansion, I think we're going to continue to make progress on this issue. Mm. And we only have a, a couple of minutes left, but I, I just wanted to ask you about, you know, being, s we're, we're in such a time that's hyper-partisan, everything is very politicized. Um, you know, what, 
what can we do to increase conversation, mm -hmm. civil conversations, and to, you know, basically, I guess, get Congress together and actually do, you know, the will of the people and, and rather than get into locked battles about, you know, blue and red, essentially. Yeah. You know, this is the most dysfunctional Congress uh, that I think we've ever seen, at least that I've seen in my lifetime. And I hear that from my colleagues in Washington as well. And it's unacceptable. It does a disservice to the American people. Uh, what we're seeing now is that under a Democratic majority, when we had record investments in especially infrastructure, a bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, that we are now rolling the projects out on the ground that are creating jobs, that are making people's lives better, uh, that we're making progress on climate and the environment, we're protecting public lands, uh, that here at the state level, uh, we can work with our Republican colleagues on common sense legislation uh, that helps improve the health care of children and their families. Um, we've got so much more work to do in Congress uh, in a bipartisan way, and there are Republican members in Congress who are willing to work with folks like me on bringing home these solutions. Uh, one of the things I've done that I've really prided myself in uh, is I've gone out to Republican and conservative communities. Uh, in fact, my first guest for the State of the Union was a Republican onion farmer from Array uh, and uh, took him to, to Washington for the first uh, time ever. And we exchanged uh, handshakes. Uh, we got to see the State of the Union and we found that we had more things in common than we had things that divided us. And so I think together as communities, uh, if we learn just to talk to each other like neighbors, I think it puts us in a better place. And New Mexico's always been a very unique and a very diverse community. You know, whether it's our past with our indigenous roots, uh, of course, our Spanish roots, uh, our agricultural roots, uh, we are a very diverse state. And I think we can be a model for the rest of the country of how we can come together and put partisan politics aside. And so whether it's Hobbs or Lordsburg or JAL uh, or the South Valley of Albuquerque or Las Cruces or Sullen Park, all those communities deserve attention from their elected leaders, and their elected leaders should be working to improve their lives, and that's what I'm here to do. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left for today. Gabe Vasquez is the U.S. Congressman for New Mexico's 2nd District. Representative Vasquez, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Johnny. That's all for today's show. Be sure and join us next week as we continue our coverage of New Mexico's legislative session. Additionally, you can keep updated on the latest news on our website at krwg.org. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Johnny Coker. We'll see you next time on Your Legislators.